Good morning and welcome to worship. I'm Andy Dunning. I'm the pastor here at University Park United Methodist Church. This video is being shown both on YouTube and on Facebook. And from 10 to 11 this morning, we're responding live to comments on both those platforms. The video will remain up on our YouTube channel for you to watch later if you'd like. If you're with us today for the first time, I want to extend a special welcome to you. For more than 125 years, University Park United Methodist Church has worked to be the hands and feet and heart of Christ for our neighborhood and for the world beyond. If you are new to worship here at UPark, please feel free to say hi and ask questions about the church in our comments. I'll be happy to get back to you. If you'd like to receive our newsletter and our weekly pastoral letter, be sure to fill out the welcome form that you'll find below this video on our YouTube channel and posted on our Facebook site as well, and we'll make sure to get those communications out to you. Also, please do take a second to click those subscribe and like buttons on YouTube. The more people who subscribe to our channel and like our videos, the easier we are to find online, and we really appreciate your help. Whoever you are, whatever you may believe or question or doubt, you are welcome in worship with us here. When the pandemic is under better control and our community is back home here in our church building, we would love to have you join us for worship. Today, we're going to be focusing on a very strange thing that Jesus does in Mark's gospel. Time after time, he performs some miracle or he heals someone, and then he tells them not to tell anyone that it was him who did it. We're going to spend some time in worship thinking about what that might mean for our practice of Christianity. I want to thank Liz Beindorf for being our liturgist today. So let's center ourselves, take a deep breath, Let's open our hearts to God's presence as Liz offers us our call to worship. The heavens are telling the glory of God and the earth proclaims God's handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Fill our creation with your word, O God. May our worship and our lives proclaim your joyful promises and sing of your glorious hope. Make us one living body, your incarnate presence on the earth. Amen. <laughs>
and I'm the Director of Wholeness and Healing. If you're a guest worshiping with us today, I'd like to invite you to fill out our guest information form. You can find the link to that form in the description of, of the YouTube video. It helps us to get to know you better and it also helps us to be able to connect you with our other ministries at the church. During this part of the service, we ask a question and invite you to participate in our live stream chat. And so today we are talking about Jesus's secret ministry. And so I would like to invite you to share about a time when somebody did something for you in secret. When I was in seminary, I was working on a um, inductive Bible study, which is a big uh, biblical research paper. And as I pulled off one of the um, reference materials needed for the paper, a note fell out and it was an encouraging note um, written just to another student. Um, it, you know, didn't have a name on it. It just said, you know, to whoever's reading this. And it was just an encouraging note and it really uplifted my day and encouraged me in the middle of that very hard um, and intense paper. So I'd like to invite you to share now about something that someone else has done for you in secret. And then I'd also invite you to take it one step further this week and think of something that you can do this week in secret for someone else. I invite you to share now. Today's scripture reading comes from Mark chapter 1, verses 32 through 45. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door, and he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. A leper came to him, begging him, and kneeling, he said to him, If you choose, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I do choose, be made clean. Immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. After sternly warning him, he sent him away at once, saying to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as testimony to them. But he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the word so that Jesus could no longer go into a town openly, but stayed out in the country and people came to him from every quarter.
Good morning, family. My name is Rodera Paris Woods, and I am the Director of Journeys in Faith, Children, Youth, and Family Ministries here at University Park United Methodist Church. Here at U Park, we have named our children change agents, as we believe in creating and cultivating the leaders of today for a better tomorrow. Calling all change agents, report to headquarters for your next mission. Good morning, change agents. How are you all doing this morning? Awesome. So I hope and pray that everyone is staying well, safe, and healthy. Our scripture lesson text today comes from Mark, the first chapter, verses 35 to 45. But today we're going to focus on verses 36 to 37. And during this time, everyone was looking for Jesus. So Jesus had been traveling around the countryside, teaching and preaching and healing people, right? And because of this, he became very, very popular. So everywhere he went, there were large crowds gathering around to hear the word of God, but also to be healed and to get their needs met. So one day Jesus was visiting Simon Peter and when he got to Peter's house, he realized that Peter's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a fever. So he went to Peter's mother-in-law, he grabbed her hand and he lifted her out of bed and immediately her fever was gone. She felt better, she was healed. In fact, she felt so much better that she went and made dinner for everyone. And guess what? <laughs> The word spread it fast that Jesus was in town. So, of course, as people began to hear that Jesus was in town, they began to gather where Jesus was. And not only that, but they brought friends along with them that also needed healing. People were looking for Jesus because they needed something that only Jesus could give them. So, of course, Jesus being Jesus, Jesus went and he healed so many people. So the next morning, Jesus woke up before everyone else, and he went outside to spend some time with God in prayer. And a little later, Peter and the rest of the disciples, they went looking for Jesus. And when they finally found Jesus, they said, we've been looking all over for you. Everyone is looking for you. Now, Jesus said to them, he ignored the statement, and he said, let's go down to the nearby towns and villages so that I can preach there also, because that is what I have come to do. So Jesus traveled all around Galilee, teaching, preaching, and healing people. And you know what I realized? Is that people are still looking for Jesus today. And they're looking for Jesus because they need something that only Jesus can give them. And you know what? As change agents, it is our job and our duty to show people Jesus, to show them in our actions, to show them how we interact with one another, how we treat one another, the things we say to one another, and also God's holy word. Also in Deuteronomy, it says that if you search for Jesus with all of your heart and soul, that you will find him. So change agents, as we continue to go through life and interact with people, if someone is looking for Jesus, they can find Jesus in you. You can show them Jesus. Amen and Ashe. Let us pray. God, we thank you for this day and this time. We know that people are still looking for Jesus. Give us strength that we may be able to show 
those who are looking for Jesus, that we may be able to show them Jesus in our words and our actions and in the way in which we treat one another. God, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and Ashe. Until next time. I think ministry is like a lot of fields, and maybe all of them, I don't know, in that all of us have important teachers who help us out along the way. Some of them, of course, are actual instructors in a formal sense, like in high school or college or seminary. Some are the people who offer us continuing education in our field. And some, maybe in some ways the most influential and important are the less formal mentors, people who we meet, who offer us their wisdom, their experience, and their willingness to guide us. One of my mentors early on was a community organizer who worked in Los Angeles. I met him through this church that I was serving as a pastoral intern there. He knew a lot about how a pastor or anybody could get involved and leverage the resources they had to change a neighborhood and even to some degree to change a city for the better. He read widely in all kinds of fields. He turned me on to some books that still influence me today. But beyond that, he had these little eminently practical tips about how to get things done. Once, when I asked him about issues he was most focused on in the neighborhoods where he worked, he said, you know what? 
Issues are tissues. One a day, throw them away. He said, I go into neighborhoods where people have been told for years that they have no power. And I work with the people there to help them see that they can band together and make their community better. Years later, when I read Stephen Covey's maxim of beginning with the end in mind, I thought of that conversation with my friend about how he pointed me that day to the importance of keeping your eye on the ball, never forgetting the big picture of what you're trying to do. So one day we were talking about his work and I asked him how he had managed to build up the platform that enabled him to do what he did. He said, well, I know this sounds simplistic, but here's a tip for you. In the beginning, you need to put your name on everything. I said, what? He said, look, you ever notice how many political signs just have the candidate's name on them? I mean, nothing else, just the name? He said, that's because studies show that people tend to vote for the candidate whose name is most familiar to them. It works the same way if you're trying to improve your community. So in your case, he said, put your name on the church letterhead. Put your name on the church sign outside the building. Publish letters to the editor. Make sure that your name appears in the paper. Attend meetings about issues in the community, issues that your community is facing, and make sure that your name appears on the list of people who were there. If your church sends a letter to the city government about crime or homelessness or something else going on in your neighborhood, make sure that your name is on it. Eventually, people will start to recognize your name. And then, when you call to talk to a city official, or somebody who runs a nonprofit, or you're calling a business to get some sponsorship for a project you've got going in the community, somewhere in the back of their mind, that person is going to think, wait, I, I know that name. And then they'll take your call. Eventually, he said, eventually you won't need to put your name on things because people will know who you are. But name recognition goes a long way in getting things done. Now, I could see his point. It made sense to me. But I got to say, I've never really practiced his advice, and maybe I've limited my effectiveness because of it. I don't know. But, but if I have, if I've limited my effectiveness in that way, at least I'm in good company. Because to judge from the reading that we just heard Liz offer, Jesus didn't seem to care a whole lot about name recognition either. In fact, in Mark's gospel, it's pretty much the opposite. For some reason, Jesus seems to go out of his way to avoid being well-known, to avoid his name being recognized. It it doesn't work, but he he certainly tries. This section of the gospel, it's a little series of short episodes that starts just before the passage that Liz read. Like most of Mark's gospel, the story moves pretty quickly. Jesus calls first the the four of the 12 apostles to, to follow him. Then he goes to a synagogue and he teaches. While he's there in the synagogue, he casts out a demon. Then he and his four new buddies, the four apostles, go to Simon's house where he heals Simon's mother who's ill with a fever. Then the whole town starts bringing people to him to be healed. So he heals them and he casts out more demons. Then he goes to bed, but before sunrise, he gets up and he goes out to the desert to pray. His disciples come out to the desert to find him because now everybody in town is looking for him to do some more healings, but instead he leaves. He goes to the neighboring towns instead so he can preach there. Then he heals a person with a skin disease. People hear about this. They come running from all over the place to be to be healed. So many people are mobbing Jesus at this point in the story everywhere he goes that Mark tells us he can't even go in to the local towns anymore. But as active as Jesus is in this part and throughout the gospel of Mark, as active as he is, as much as he's doing, He keeps trying to stop people from talking about him. When he casts out the demon in the synagogue, he orders it to be silent and not to say who he is. At Simon's house, he does the same thing. When people seek him out, he leaves and he goes to other towns. When he heals the man with the skin disease, he tells him not to say anything about what happened. Jesus does this kind of thing so often in the Gospel of Mark, that Bible scholars actually have a name for it. 
They call it the Messianic secret, or sometimes the Markan secret. Three times in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus casts out demons and he tells them not to reveal his identity. Three other times, he performs miraculous healings. And then he tells the people he has healed to zip it. Don't tell anybody, he says. Twice, he tells the disciples not to tell anybody about him. A couple of times, he tries to hide out and sneak around so nobody knows where he is. This stuff happens all the time in the gospel. Even though Jesus says right here in the passage that we just heard that he has come to proclaim the message. So he clearly would have had no use for my friend's advice about the power of name recognition. For whatever reason, he doesn't seem to want it, even though he's getting plenty of it anyway. So here's what I wonder about this story. On the one hand, Jesus says he wants to proclaim the message. And then on the other, he tells people not to talk about him. So what if the message he's trying to proclaim is not about him at all? What if the message Jesus is trying to proclaim is not about his identity as the Holy One of God? What if it's not about his miraculous power, his special relationship to God? What if Jesus' message instead is about our authority, our ability, who we can be, who we are called to be. Nowadays, I know that it is hard to know how to understand these stories of healing and especially stories about unclean spirits. Some scholars have argued for a long time that demon possession was just the first century understanding of mental illness, and maybe sometimes it was. But I think there's more going on here than that. I think that because the gospel writers are part of an enormously sophisticated storytelling tradition. Their stories are nuanced and subtle and multi-layered, and they mean all kinds of things at once. I think that when the gospel authors write about demon possession or other diseases, they're almost always writing in some way about how social ills, social diseases, inequalities, inequities of power and status are showing up in the lives of ordinary people. In that sense, maybe the gospel author's understanding of disease is almost as useful as ours. One of my favorite authors on Mark's gospel is a scholar named Ched Myers. Myers has read Mark very carefully for decades, and he's written a great deal about the book. Myers argues that this sequence of stories that we just heard this morning, it's actually not about miraculous healings. Myers says the real subject of these stories is about people being freed from unjust power. Unjust power of all kinds, the power of the Roman Empire, the power of demonic influence, the power of the temple, the power of the cult of purity. Myers points out something that is so obvious that we usually don't even notice it. Nowadays, he says, we understand illness as a medical disorder, right? I mean, that's kind of the definition of being sick, after all. Something's gone wrong. Something's gone wrong with our body or our brain. It's malfunctioning somehow. So if we can go to the doctor, we get medicine or surgery or some other treatment to repair the problem. Myers says that in, fir in the first century Mediterranean world of Jesus and the apostles, the understanding was very different. There, he says, disease and things like demon possession were understood as signs of impurity, or sin. They were understood as signs that someone was not fit to be part of the community. These things made people outsiders and unclean, and they got them cast out. So when Jesus heals someone or casts out a demon, he's not fixing their body. I mean, he is that, but he's not just fixing their body. He's restoring them to the community. And as he does that, he is also challenging the unjust powers that rejected them in the first place. This really shows up in the last scene of the reading we heard this morning, 
when Jesus heals the man with the skin disease. The Bible calls it leprosy, but it probably wasn't that. That's just the generic term in the Gospels for a skin disease that renders somebody unclean, that makes them an outcast, is not fit to be around their family or, or their village or in the temple. The man asks Jesus to do something that's actually only supposed to be done by a priest in the temple. He kneels and he asks Jesus to make him clean. See, in the practice of the day, there was an elaborate ritual described in the book of Leviticus for declaring someone clean. It takes several weeks. It involves making what are called guilt offerings and sin offerings to atone for the impurity that is supposed to have caused the skin disease in the first place. Jesus, on the other hand, has a very different vision, a much simpler and quicker one. The man says, if you choose, you can make me clean. And Jesus reaches out his hand and touches him and says, I do choose. Be made clean. Now, there's an important point in this passage that doesn't show up in most English translations, but it's definitely there in Greek. Jesus is angry. Jesus is angry. He's not angry with the man who needs healing. He's angry with the priests and the power of the temple system that has grown up around them. In most English translations, he tells the man to show himself to the priest as a testimony to them. But a lot of scholars say that the much more accurate translation would be show yourself to the priest as a witness against them. Show yourself as a witness against them. So Jesus is saying with his words and his actions, you want to be healed? You're healed. You're clean. Because that's what God wants for you. Don't talk about me. Go show yourself to the priests as a witness against them. A witness against a purity cult that would blame and shame and exclude and ostracize people at the moment when they most need compassion and help. See, the real illness, I think, that Jesus has diagnosed here, it's not impurity or sin. It's not even a medical disorder. It is a weakness in our ability to care for each other. Jesus is angry because of a temple system and a society that prevents people from getting what they most need in their most vulnerable moments. I think Jesus tries to hide his identity because he's not here to take over the priest's authority, to assert that he's somehow more special than they are. He's here instead to give that authority away to all of us, to give all of us the authority to say, be made clean, or at least be as clean or as dirty as the rest of us, all struggling through this life together. See, this isn't just a story about the first century world of Jesus. This is a story about us. It's a story that asks important questions. How do we care for each other? Who does our circle of care include? Who does our circle of care exclude? What are we doing? What are we doing with the authority that Jesus has given us to look out for and care for the people who are shunned and shamed and ostracized, to provide the care and compassion they need to be whole, and in that process, to become whole ourselves. How are we using that authority? Just like in the world of Jesus, it is true here and now, that our social ills, our social diseases, are often visible in the lives of ordinary people. People who don't have access to medical care. People who haven't been able to get vaccines. Some of us, myself included, have easy access to everything we have ever needed to thrive. Others simply don't have that access. Now, I know that I have taken full advantage of some of those opportunities and others I've just squandered. And you know what? I have never suffered a single penalty for that. So, 
we can do that first century purity cult move. We can point to people who are sick or poor or uneducated, and we can say, well, that's their problem, right? They didn't apply themselves. They didn't take care of their health. They didn't take advantage of the opportunities that were offered. And maybe sometimes, maybe that's even true. We all squander opportunities. But when we take that attitude, maybe we're squandering one ourselves. Maybe then we're squandering the opportunity to ask, what are we doing to care for others? What are we doing to lift all of us up? There are lots of stories in the Gospels about the miraculous power of Jesus, about his status as the Son of God, the Holy One. Those stories are beautiful. They absolutely have their place in our faith. But maybe the great challenge for us in the stories we heard this morning is to become the kind of community Jesus was trying to build. A place where people don't have to undergo any lengthy ritual to be acceptable. A place where healing and wholeness come not from the dramatic actions of some charismatic leader, but from the grace that is available to everybody. A community that does not offer brokered access to power or experts who can connect us to God, but that rather provides all of us the healing, the place, the grace, the space, the spiritual home that we all so desperately need. Let's be that community. Let me invite you to pray with me. Lord God, you welcome all of us in love. You have created all people, and we know that you dwell among us now. Listen, we pray, to the cries of all those who turn to you. Grant that as we learn to walk in your light, to live by your peace, grant that those around us will see your glory and know you more closely in our lives, in the community we create, in the compassion and the wholeness and the humble service that we share. We pray all these things in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The celebration of communion, which is also called Eucharist, is perhaps the oldest ritual in Christian worship. In the early church, Eucharist was often a full meal. Christians of all ages and backgrounds and places in society would sit down together at a common table, recognizing that across differences, across borders, across anything that may divide us, we are one in Christ. We invite you now to join in that ritual wherever you are. On the night when Jesus was betrayed into the hands of his enemies, he shared a meal with his 12 closest friends. They were laborers and fishermen. Some were outsiders to society, while others had given up secure places to follow him. Some in their previous lives had embraced violence, while others had been peaceful. But they joined in a common meal, a celebration that reflected the fellowship and community they had found in one another. At the meal, there was bread on the table. And so Jesus lifted the bread and asked God's blessing on it. And then he told his disciples, this is my body that is soon to be broken for you and for many. Whenever you eat this bread together, do it in remembrance of me. There was wine on the table and Jesus lifted the cup and gave God thanks. Then he said to his disciples, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink this cup, do it in remembrance of me. 
Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his great love. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Please join us in the celebration of communion. During the pandemic, homelessness and food insecurity have risen dramatically. In response, our city and a group of nonprofit agencies, some of which are our nonprofit partners here at U Park, have set up what are called safe outdoor spaces. These are tent communities for our neighbors without homes. They're well lit and maintained. The tents are high quality and sturdy and dry and safe and warm. Services are available to help people get off the streets and into sustainable permanent housing. Over the past month, two groups of people from our church have cooked and served meals in one of our city's safe outdoor spaces. And in May, we'll be doing that again. At the end of last year, we made a donation to Showers for All, a nonprofit agency providing showers and bathrooms and laundry facilities at the safe outdoor spaces. We also gave all of our Christmas Eve offering to the St. Francis Center and to Metro Caring, two agencies involved in helping people in need in our city. So when you support our shared ministry here at U Park, that is just part of the good work that you are doing in the community. University Park United Methodist Church is committed to being a place where everyone is welcome and where we grow spiritually by serving as Jesus served. Thank you so much for your generosity and for your compassionate hearts. If you would like to support our work financially, you can go to our website at uparkumc.org. That web address again is uparkumc.org. 
click on giving at the top of the page and just follow the prompts you see there. If you haven't yet made a financial pledge of support for 2021, you can use the box that's called special gifts. Now, you can also text to give. You can text 833-995-1238. That number again is 883-995-1238. When you send that text message, just put the dollar amount you'd like to give in the message block and follow the prompts that you'll receive. If you'd prefer to mail a check, our mailing address is also on our website. So again, thank you so much for your generosity. Thank you so much for all the ways that you support this ministry that we share. Good morning, everyone. This is Kevin Fonberg Rollins, your church administrator, and it's time for Love and Faith in Action. Today, after services at 11.30 a.m., we will be holding a Zoom meeting to discuss the reconciling vote for University Park United Methodist Church. This vote will take place next Sunday, February 14th at 11.30 a.m. on Zoom. Please reach out to Pastor Andy if you have any questions and check out tomorrow's newsletter for the link. Pub Theology is back next Saturday, February 13th. It will be held on Zoom from 3 to 4 p.m. The meeting will be led by Isaac Dunn and this week's theme is healing. Check the newsletter for the sign-up and contact Isaac if you have any questions. We will be making pancakes again this year. On Tuesday, February 16th from 4 to 6 p.m., the U Park staff will be preparing pancakes as we have in the past, only this time we have curbside pickup. We will, of course, be wearing hairnets, masks, and gloves during the food preparation. Donations are welcome and will go toward the Reconciling Ministry Network. Please contact Radera Paris Woods if you have any questions. That's all I have for you today. I hope you all have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday. As we conclude our worship today and embark on our week, may the everlasting God, who gives strength to the powerless and power to the faint, who raises the sick and vanquishes evil, the God of compassion, be with you. May God give us courage to be agents of healing and wholeness, that the good news of God's presence may be made known to the ends of creation. Thank you so much for joining us in worship today. And may God's peace be with you.